Oh, thank you. Uh, you can all hear me, can't you? Okay, so I'm Johnny Morris, as you probably know, and for some of you who are old enough, that's a name you can't forget. For the rest of you, oh, gilded youth. Um, okay, so I'm, I'm a data migration specialist. I've been doing data migration since 1997. Um, so that's quite a long time. I've got two books written and a third one that I'm supposed to be supposed to have written. Um, so don't tell me publisher that I'm still working on it. Um, and uh, in a moment you'll see some slides. Um, so I've got, I've, I've got a, a methodology and uh, here it is on a nice, a nice slide. You can take one home with you if you want. Makes good Christmas wrapping paper, if nothing else. Sorry? Uh, I think the slides have been copied over, haven't they? I have no idea. I gave somebody a stick and let them get on with it. <laughs> First failure, you see, we should have a, a DQR for that. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, we've I'll just carry on talking until, you know, well, you know, pretend, pretend this was... Exactly, yeah. But we'll pretend this is all part of the show, okay? But I'll tell you what I will, I will say to you, just as a, a facilities matter, the toilets are just round there if you can't find them. They're not well signposted. Um, and it's, it's a, there's a sign about that, that big saying WC. So if you can't find them, that's where they are. Um, and any second now, we'll have, we'll have lift off, perhaps. Um, okay, so data migration. Um, I think the big... The big mistake that a lot of people make when they do data migrations is to assume that it's whole or wholly or largely a technical task. Uh, sorry, data migration overview. Oops, it's more complicated, isn't it? Uh, yeah, so it's a, it, the mistake a lot of people make is to think that it's largely a technical project. Actually, the, the, you'll spend more time in a data migration um, working with your business partners and colleagues uh, than you will um, with the actual technology. I very rarely see the technology fail when I go into pro projects that are failing. It's, it's almost always organizational um, and lack of proper engagement. So anyway, so oh, this, there we're ready to rock and roll now. Thank you very much. I don't need training on this. Left or right? Oh, there we go. Thank you. Short training program there. So as I say, this is this is a not quite as detailed version of the um, PDM uh, PDM version two um, thing. And I'll, I'll, I'll walk us through it. I'm sure there are other data migration um, methodologies. I've never seen one, but I'm sure there must be some others. But what the benefit of this view is, it this covers the complete floor space of a data migration. Floor, you know, wall to wall, floor to ceiling. Now anybody who's involved in migration is probably not going to use all of this because it just falls outside of the scope of what they're doing or is deemed unnecessary but it gives you a checklist to say well if i'm not doing it if i'm not doing system retirement who is right so it gives you a nice checklist to make sure you've got no gaps uh, and you've got no no overlaps so we'll go through it a bit at a time and if you've got if you've got any questions just ask I was going to say ask then, but I'm not, I'm not a southerner, so I'll stick with my northern roots. Okay, technical. So we're going to do, it's, it's kind of broke down into a technical stream, a business engagement stream, and then a very, very important DQR stream that spans the two, brings the two together, the meat in the sandwich. The first thing, the first thing you've got to do on any, well, if, if you're going to do this thing in a structured way, um, Oh, just as another aside, the way I describe this is very waterfall. It's just a lot easier to describe things in a waterfall. You do this and then it leads into that and that leads into that. I mean, it's actually under, under the hood, it's very much an agile approach because data migration, we're always at the end of the, end of the uh, follow, we're always following the band, as it were. So we've got to be able to deal with, um, we've got to be able to deal with, uh, you know, with, with unforeseen, issues that creep out of UAT and all the rest of it. So we're quite often still writing our code with about three weeks to go to cut over that situation normal. So it's, it's, it's very agile, but it's just a lot easier to describe it if we do it a chunk at a time. So landscape analysis. Okay, hands up who knows what landscape analysis is? I'm, I'm glad that, I'm glad. <laughs> I'm glad Paul at the back knows it. All right, okay, now, now, we've got, now we've got an expert. Okay, so when, when I get things wrong, you can correct me. So landscape analysis, that's, that's, that's looking at your legacy, um, your legacy data stores. Now, 
there's a there's a sort of misconception you can't possibly start data migration until you've got a target well that's wrong because first of all you won't have a target it won't be delivered on time it never is and when it is does get delivered it'll be delivered in bits and those bits will then be rewritten a few times so to, what you've got to do is you, you can never gain any time at the end of a project you've got to move as much as you can back up the timeline to where you've actually got time and you remember that if you're if you're doing a hospital migration it's going to be you're going to be dealing with hospitals patients and all the rest of it at the end of the migration just as you were at the beginning so 90 odd percent of what you're doing doesn't change and if you've got if you've got you know and as we all know and i'm sure nobody's going to admit to it but if you've got a if you're doing a, if you if you're working on a system and it's got whole uh, wings of hospitals missing or wings of hospitals that are no longer there and uh, still in the database then you're going to have to sort that out before you know whatever you're moving the data so you're going to find that there's there's lots of stuff that needs needs sorting out and you can get started on it right at the beginning it's a bit like building a bridge you've got to do your surveying on both sides of the river so landscape analysis uh, is is your profiling and in the talk this afternoon we'll look at profiling it's finding all those legacy data stores that actually run the organization, all the spreadsheets and all the rest of it that are really crucial, not just the three or four uh, corporate systems that you've been told about. It's making relationships with the key business people on the floor who actually know, understand what's going on and so on. So landscape analysis is a big chunk of time and it's done, if you're doing it in a, in a waterfall project, it's done at the beginning from the set, from the, from the moment the, the whistle blows on the start of the, of the, start of the project, um, you start doing landscape analysis. As I said, the only time I've ever worked on a project where the fundamentals of the organization were changing was on the poll tax project. And that tells you how long I've been in IT. And that was a car, and I was totally like a car crash. Um, so that's landscape analysis. What, I, what I'll do is I'll make available a short 100 word sort of precy of all this so you can, you can have something that make, just whets your appetite so you go and buy the book. I've got to pay for my holidays somehow. So, uh, so the next step is gap analysis and mapping. Now, at this, at this point, your, you know, the, the target is beginning to hove into view. We're beginning to see some parts of what the target's going to hold for us. And we can start looking at the differences between what we, what we you know, the structures of, of, of what we've got in our source, which we now know because we've done our landscape analysis, and what's in, what the target requires. But as I say, we've got to be fleet of foot because we, it won't be, you know, it won't be right. It won't be UAT, you know, I've been UAT tested, et cetera, et cetera. So we've got to be care. We've got to have ways of tracking changes, and we'll, we'll we'll come to that as again probably this afternoon. I'll talk about that in a bit more detail. Um, so within your gap analysis mapping, that's where you, you actually do the mapping. Now I'm going to just. I know there's lots of different ways these days, especially if you're working agile, um, and there's lots of software. That where you can drop and drag and drop and all the rest of it but if we stick to the old view of, you've got a mapping spreadsheet because i think that's something we can all understand so what you're getting is you know somewhere coming into here you're getting a the left hand side of your mapping spreadsheet and your job is to you know fill that in across to the right hand side of the mapping spreadsheet and then write the code accordingly to populate the data the data that you want to deliver um so that's in there, and in there we also have things like data modeling and things like that. So this is this is a quite a, a techie bag of, uh, as I know somebody said there was a business analyst in, in the room, but it's, it's very much a mix of, of data-centric business analyst work um, and technical work to do some, some technical analysis. And it's also, it is actually creating the, the, the mapping if that's the way you do it. And obviously I've just broken this out like this because it's easier to explain. A lot of that time that will be overlapping because you'll be using tools that both do the analysis and do the do the mapping at the same time um, then we've got the, uh, the the migration design and execution so this is these are all the sort of you know this is kind of like your ETL really in a way I mean that's you're getting it from there you're munging it about in there and you're gonna dump it somewhere in there so within migration design and execution we do obviously the design of the of the, of the design and build of the um, of the physical migration we do the the logical all the work that's got to go around it because normally in a migration you might run the migration for four days but the prep and the, and the aftermath use it's usually run over about two weeks to start elegantly closing things down um and i don't know enough about uh, the, the nhs but if you take you know if you take the example of a 
uh, well, even the NHS really, if you've got invoices and stuff like that, you'll start wanting to correct, you know, wanting to take all the invoices to a point when you can easily migrate them. because You don't want a half paid invoices and all that sort of stuff. So it, it, you want to do all that and that's, that's the lead up to actually cutting over. And all that's defined, all that's defined in there. We also define our fallback never go into a data migration without a fallback. Without fallback. I've never had to um, actually use the fallbacks, but if you look at all the significant ones that have crashed, the big problem wasn't that they went wrong. The big problem was they didn't have any way of getting out of it. So our bank is, uh, uh, and that was, that was a wreck when it, when it tried to cut over. You know, we're all locked out of our accounts. Fortunately, I could see it coming because I could tell from what the sort of start of the activities they'd already sent out and the software that didn't work. So I drew enough money out to pay the wages. I kind of thought we wouldn't be able to access the account for a month. Or, and I was probably about right. But the problem they had there is they had no way of going back. They didn't know how they were going to rescue the situation. They were just going to blunder on forwards. And as an aside, they still haven't, fi they still haven't fixed the, um, the, the was it called two factor authentication even now. So it tells you just what a mess it is in the back, in the back, back office. So anyway. So that's migration to own execution, and you always have your fallback. The next key thing is, is legacy decommissioning. This is what it's all about, right? This is what we're doing. We're turning systems off permanently. Now, that doesn't mean to say that the systems don't, don't carry on. I mean, quite often, it's just a logical decommissioning. When we were working on the, uh, on the disengagement of Jaguar Land Rover from Ford, obviously, the Ford systems carried on working because Ford's a global car company, and it couldn't just stop them. But from a certain point, it agreed in the contract, they were no longer available to Land Rover because Jaguar Land Rover at that point would have been, was a competitor, it still is a competitor. So it might be, a, as I say, it might be a logical decommissioning, but there will be a decommissioning. And that's really, we, as we'll see in a minute, using this as a lever is, is a significant benefit. We have a compelling event that other people in the sort of data management arena don't have. We are going to turn systems off and I like to have a nice plan which has a red dot on it that says we're turning systems off on that day. I don't like projects that don't have a clean end date. You know, we don't know when it's now. We want to know when it's alive and I'm going to turn stuff off. Um, and the benefit of that is we'll see when we're actually talking to, when, when you're talking to the, um, the business side of things, especially senior management, if you start mentioning data migration, the shutters come down. You know what I mean? It's like, oh, you know, I'm not, you know, it's not for me, blah, 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 blah. I don't listen to any of that. But if you start talking about, right, we're switching the system off. So, Mr. Financial Director, come the 30th of September, we're turning your, we're turning your accounts receivable package off and you won't be able to access it ever again. And also, on the 1st of September, I'm going to come to you and get you to sign a deal. It's okay for us to do that because it's your system you've got responsibility for making that decision. Nice, easy thing to understand. Everybody can get it. It makes the fact that it's going to happen real and it's something that people would be concerned about. It's, it's some, it becomes an, oh my gosh, it's really going to happen. I better get my, better make sure it's, 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 you know, everything's working. And we'll see in a second how, how you come back from that. So legacy decommissioning is really, is really significant. We also have in there all the other things you put in legacy, because obviously, you know, you can't just switch you know, you can't just switch things off. You've got to make sure you've decommissioning, you've, you've, you've closed any, uh, you know, any, any supplier uh, logons, you've changed IP addresses, you've recovered any, no, it's not so much hardware these days, it's all in the cloud, isn't it? But you've recovered the hardware, you've recovered the software, you've got, you've got rid of all the licenses, you don't want to be caught with licenses that are still, uh, people still using software that's not licensed, although there doesn't seem to be as much investigation of that as there was. Um, and you want to you want to make sure that that everything going forward, um, and we'll talk about long running DQRs in a minute. But everything running going forward is is tucked away and in position. So it likes decommissioning very important, and often overlooked. Quite often people will you know I'll get in there and the, the project's already you know six months or a year late, and even at that point they haven't thought about the um, the, the legacy. And I've worked in other in other projects where you know growling away basement is the, the sort of the undead you know the those systems that won't die um the, the the worst one was a bank and i shan't name it 
um, who were really struggling because, you know, that the old mainframes, most some of us are old enough to remember these, were big and they ran very hot and they were water cooled. So they were quite literally pumped into the framework of the building. And they had, you know, they had a great grandfather and a grandfather and father machines down there. Two, two of them were actually plumbed into, and obviously they were well out of um, support. They had their own spares and the own guy was actually fixing them. But the lease on the building had run out. And the landlord who wanted to, re, you know, knock it down and rebuild it, uh, got wind of the fact that they, <laughs> that they couldn't escape. And he was charging them something like 10 million a month or something. So it was, it was considerably draining their, their pockets. And that's because, of course, at no point had anybody, you know, sort of thought to themselves, well, how the heck do we decommission? You know, we've got to do something better than just leaving something grunting around in the background. Um, and that's especially the case, I guess, with you guys, because you've got, like other places that we've worked, you've got like whole life records, that, you know, that you need, so you need to be able to, you know, you need, like this might be 70 or 80 years time, 50 years time, you still may need these records. So it's important to know, to think in advance, how you're going to do it. So within here, just as we have a, a, a an ETL design and build and a cutover for the target, we also have one for the legacy. Um, I mean, there's nothing wrong if, if it's, it's appropriate and just keeping an old system, you know, with one license and, you know, letting it, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. As long as you've made a decision to do it, you just haven't blundered into it because you've spent all the, all the budget and you can't think of anything else to do. Okay, then we have the, down here we have the business engagement stream, which you can't actually see. There is actually a, a, a thing there, but I'll see it on here. But anyway, different things. So this is the business engagement stream, uh, stream down here. Um, and as you see, we, 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 re, we do really, you know, maximize the, the fact that, that we're going to start decommissioning things. Over here, we have the stakeholder management. Um, there's a number of stakeholders, but the most important to us is data owners. When we say data owners, we don't mean the guy on the, on the organization chart whose name, you know, usually the CTO or the finance officer, whose name on the chart says, there, you're, you're the data owner for that. The data on as well, as far as we're concerned, is anybody who can red flag the migration, anybody who can stop the migration occurring, even if they're in, in on the structure of the organisation in a relatively junior role. Like, for instance, your your, your guy responsible for data protection, uh, your data protection officer, can say, no, you can't go live because of this. So you've got to find out, find all these people who can stop you from going live. And then you get them to actually go through the process of telling you all the things that they need to be fulfilled for them to go live. And you start this process early because people, the earlier you start it, the easier it is. Because when you start a project, everybody's, you know, the honeymoon period, everybody's full of it and it's never going to go wrong and all the rest of it. So it's a lot easier to get that engagement going than waiting until the end. And then that's when all the people start getting twitchy and start thinking of reasons not to do it. You want to get all the reasons not to do it out as soon as possible. For those of you who've read the book, you know there's a kind of a, a tick list in there, checklist to get you going on things like fallback, fall, fallout management, um, how much history data you want to have, and so on, transitional business processes. Um, just a word about transitional business processes. There's always some things that you need to do just because you're doing a migration. Now, that could be, for instance, if you're doing a migration um, in a in a hospital, it could be making sure you've got enough stores in, you know, in stock. You might have to over order so that you've got enough stuff because you may not be able to use the order system or, you know, if, if the order system is not working or, you know, so you've got to put a bit of contingency in. So that's a transitional business process. It's doing the things that you wouldn't normally have to do. I mean, the, I mean, the other thing, I mean, there's loads of standard transitional business processes dealing with invoices that come when you've got paying, doing the payroll that comes dealing with VAT. Um, these days, money transfers can just happen, you know, it's out of your control. It's not like you can stack all the checks up and then pay them in two weeks later. You're going to get that stuff coming in, direct debits and electronic payments all the time. So what are you going to do with it? And if it does, you do need to fall back, how are you going to manage that? So transitional business processes are very important and we tack those onto the end of this thing here. It may not be the right place, but it's a place. Um, uh, and, and, you know, you need to go out and find them. Because um, it's, again, you know, day of migrations, it's even in a large 
organization like a hospital is likely to be a once in a business lifetime activity. You will have no expertise in it, chances are. Some places are always doing migrations, uh, big pharmaceuticals and things like that, always do migrations. But for most organizations, even big ones, you'll only encounter it once as, as you know, you probably never want to do it again anyway, so you'll run away the next time. You'll make sure you're in the meeting the next time when it's decided who's going to take responsibility for it. Well, unless you like big and you really love it. Um, look for punishment. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, so as a transitional business process. Yeah, and as, uh, as I say, it, all these things are difficult because the projects are failing. And there's a couple of questions I ask, and every project that's failing has these two things wrong with them. And we'll cover those in a second. Um, but if I forget, you can ask me and I'll tell you. And, it, and it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's just so, yeah, you haven't read the book, that's what it is. Uh, yeah, so, so there we go. So that's our key data stakeholders. And, you know, we get them to sign this system retirement plan. As I say, if you're not using this model, if you, if you, you know, if you want to make it up yourself, not a great idea. You, your chance of failing goes up by about... Uh, 20 percent if you try to paddle your own canoe just share that with you but um so but it's possible um so you want to do yourself but you still got to do all these things you're still going to have to do transitional business processes you still got to get people to sign it off or take responsibility for it um and you know you still got to obviously do the building you've got to know where you're getting your best data from you've got to know to close things down all these things need to be done however you you know, however you choose to execute and whether you choose to, and, and of course you've got to tune the, the, the model because you know what you're doing, even in hospitals that look very similar, will be different because you've got different people play, you know, different people there, different roles, slightly different ways of doing things, different legacy systems. So you've got, you know, you'll always have to tune, tune what you do, um, but you've got to make sure that, you know, you go through this and you think, right, well, who's doing, you know, who's doing this? Who's doing all the bits and bobs in there? Who's doing the transitional business process? How are they being communicated? How are they being trained out and so on? How's the, the comms going to the, to the business, the communication to the business? So, so you know, so fo focus on it and think, you know, and, and if you, the, the only thing we've done a project is if you raise an issue and say to the program manager, nobody's doing this particular task, you're likely to find out it's you that's doing it. As soon as you leave the meeting, that's how I got in migration in the first place. I couldn't. I was like, well, where are you going to get the data from? Where are you going to get the data from? And the program manager got fed up with it and made me the the fall guy. Uh, and I made all the mistakes that you know you don't have to make. And that's you know that's why you get something like this. And you you know at least you've got a head start. Uh, you don't make the, the mistakes. you can make up mistakes of your own. Uh, okay, so then we got um, DQR data quality rules. Um, this is uh, this is this is the key, really. If you're not doing this, you can you can mess around with the other bits and pieces. Um, but if you're not doing this, you're not doing PDM. Now, as I say, business engagement is key to um, is key to running a, 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 a data migration project. You'll have started here because you're uh, well. You know, too much. You just pick people up all over the place. It's not like be nice if it was this structured but in real life it isn't you start doing that as soon as you get your feet on the ground and then you might not get that completed for weeks and weeks later because you've got to identify the right people and they've got to accept responsibility for it but in theory you get you go see these people and once they once you get the message once they internalize the message that they are going to be held responsible um quite quickly uh they go well you know i'll, I'll take responsibility for it as long as the, you know, the whatever it is, the he's and head the sort of clinical supervisor or whatever, as long as they sign up to, for their bit, um, I mean, I, I use the finance example because everyone understands that. So as long as you purchase Ledger Clark, uh, you know, Nancy to purchase Ledger Clark, she says it's okay, you know, and then if if Frank, the, um, the sales ledger guy, if he says it's all right, you know, and then so on. I was looking in a, a, a social services that was in special measures because so, assistance was so poor. And um, so it was, it was a fairly tense and fraught atmosphere where nobody wanted to take responsibility for anything, as you can imagine. And I'm in a room like this, right, it's the, the, the boardroom, and it's one of those nice oval tables that you get in the boardroom. 
And um, so I, you know, I said to him, well, I said to the, it was child services, and I said to the, the head of child services, obviously, you know, you're going to be having to sign this off. And there was a guy, one of these noises in the room. Uh, and then, and then he did, the, and, and you could see, you could see, as I was looking down the thing, you could see the rolly chairs going back like this. <laughs> and he's a big guy, you know what I mean? And they're just hiding, you know? But he wasn't having any of that. He just looked around and went, right, I'm not doing it unless you <laughs> sign this and you sign that and you sign that. It was, it was comical, but it, 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 it works. Because then you get those people, and of course those people tend in large organizations to actually not know the detail of what's, you know, how to do the stuff so they go and put, they get their own, what we call business domain experts. Um, they get their own, bit, the business domain experts who have the knowledge, the real hands-on knowledge of how things go on. And that gets you, that gets you buy-in and it gets the right people. But to actually bond people together into a team, bearing in mind that you've probably got people from disparate departments who've maybe got a history of not getting on with each other, interpersonal rivalries and all the rest of it, or just don't know each other in a, in a large organization. Um, but so to try and bond them into a team, this is this is the best way. Of, this is this works, and it works because what you've got on this is you, on. If you imagine this is like a our boardroom table again, on this side you've got all the technical guys. So that's the people who are legacy system experts, people who are doing the mapping, people who are target system experts. Uh, you get those people and they sit in a room, uh, and on this side you've got all the business domain experts. Uh, and at the head of the table, you've got the data migration analyst facilitating the process. And you meet on a regular basis, and every every issue, doesn't matter how big or how small it is, every issue goes through the DQR process. Now, I'm not going to talk you through it at the moment, but it's basically you raise them, they come to the DQR board, the DQR board collectively makes a decision um, about what they do with them. And obviously, those decisions, you can leave it because it's bad in the source, it's bad in the target, and nobody really cares. Um, you can fix it in the source, which is the second most common thing. Leaving it is the most common thing. Okay, so the thing is, right, I, I, there's, well, there's, a, there's a set of rules that I run by, but one of the rules is no company wants, needs, or will pay for, no organization wants, needs, or will pay for perfect quality data. Right, and, and it, that's just true. I, I did some work for um, Greater Manchester Fire Brigade, which is the li second largest fire and rescue service in the UK. Uh, and, and you think, you know, when you have a big fire and these dead bodies lying around the place and, you know, it's, it's, it's cut millions of pounds of the damage and there's possible criminal proceedings, you think that every bit of data would want to be, you know, would be sacrosanct. But the fact is that if you've got a big fire going on, you know, the firefighters don't stay there all the time. It might, it might run for three or four days. So they rotor shift in and out. And one of the things they do is they put like a chuck wagon, you know, a, a, a refreshment uh, caravan goes down there. Um, and the the firefighters, you know, get the refreshments. Now on on, the, on that particular one, they had a till, and on that till, it was they had you know an EPOS system, so it was recording how many burgers they sold and how many you know meat and veg sandwiches they sold and all the rest of it. Nobody was interested in that data at all because Terry, the, um, the the manager of the of the catering, knew what the guys, I suppose guys and girls now wanted. Um, and you know, and, and also, if they didn't get what they wanted, the feedback was fairly automatic. So it didn't need anybody to study any data. But the data was there, and you know, so even on a situation like that, and to be honest, <clears throat> you got a big fire like that. You, what you'll get is you'll get initial early reports that people, will, but then you'll get hundreds of reports because it'll be seen from a long way away, and people, lots of people will phone up, and they're not as interested in the hundreds of other people unless some explosion happens and somebody else and they need to look at that. They're not really that interested in all the other people who say, "Yeah, I can see a fire going on," you know, because they kind of know about it. So, um, so it, it's it's you know, even so, even in, in situations like that, life and death situations like that, which I guess you know, you, you guys are responsible for. It's not everything's not not as, as important as as everything else. There's some things that are really key, and there's other things which are useful to be, do the business processes, and there are other bits which you know people are not are not really bothered about. So anyway, so so it comes into comes into our DQR process, and as I say, that you need it like this because the, obviously there are, people tend to focus on this side of the table. That's the trouble. That's where things go wrong. Uh, and, and technologists, are, are, you know, are by nature complete finishers. By nature, they want everything done exactly right. 
And um, also what they'll do is they'll pick something up because it's interesting to them and they'll fix that thing at the expense of something else, which just seems a bit boring. And, you know, why would anybody want to do that? So to make sure that what they're doing matches what they want, it's all discussed through this, this board. We have two, we don't have one priority. We have two priorities on DQRs. One is a technical priority. Will it load, will it not load? And if it does load, will it really break something? That's kind of a technical priority. And the business priority, a bit more difficult, is, okay, it loads, or, or it doesn't load. If it doesn't load, is that a big business problem? Yes or no. If it does load, is it going to cause a problem downstream if we don't, if we don't sort this issue out or if it's wrongly shaped or whatever? So, because quite often you can get the data in, it just doesn't work for the business, right? And, uh, and that's not nice. So it's important that we have these two. And so we, we prioritize everything within there. And then we I say, I'll talk a bit more this afternoon about how, how you can manage it in a more agile way. We, we make sure it gets allocated um, to a point and then and we know when it's going to be fixed. And we can at any time, we can, metri we can put metrics on, um, you know, how much is outstanding, what our data readiness is and so on, our migration readiness is. But the other thing to, about this is that it, it, it really does build the team because you've got, You've got a bunch of problems that everybody's working on. And obviously you have disagreements in, in, in meetings like that. But disagreements are actually quite constructive because if you want to get people over the denial curve, a, a, a argument is one of the first steps, isn't it? Denial is the first thing and then there's you know, um, negotiation and arguing and all the rest of it. So you've got to get them over that first, over that first step. And, and having it in here, and people bond better when they're faced with a, a um, with, with a faced with a, a common problem. That's just the way humans are, you know, the spirit of the blitz and all that sort of stuff. It's the way we work. And you can imagine a small tribe out in, the, in Africa, it was probably a survival thing as well. So when we're all, you know, when these guys are all fixed, facing the same, you know, pro problems that they, they share, then they bond. And, and it's, it's just amazing. If you get that working properly, it's, it solves just about every problem you, you're going to have. So if you get that working pro properly, it solves your business engagement issues, it solves your, your, your business knowledge issues. And it, you know you are going to get data quality issues. On a, on a project, you'll probably get about 800 of these. Right, so you know, face it, that's what's going to happen. Um, okay, moving on. Yeah, so DQR is really important. Um, out of all this, as I say, we can get you know, we can get things like metrics from here, so we actually know how close our data quality is, is to the required data quality. Um, and from all these other bits and pieces, we get, you know, we get the, not the standard, you know, how much has been built, how many, how many um, legacy data stores are there that we still, that we still got to, um, we still got to investigate, uh, you know, and from the system retirement plans, all the, all the, all the, all the, um, requirements that are stored in here that are not to do with the, with mapping and data quality. So it's all the other things that are in here. We can track that those are getting delivered um, and so on. So it's um, so what you get in here is all your standard stuff, plans and budgets and you know all uh, risk logs and all that sort of stuff. Um, but you also get these particular data flows going into it. And uh, is anybody here responsible for data management? Or will they be, will, will you be responsible for data management when your new systems are in? No, don't do any of that. <laughs> data management, what's that? Anyway, if you I are. Don't do that. Don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> no, if you have. Uh, data management, I'm talking about data management in the formal sense uh, of all those things like data quality, um, single oh. data models, you know, all the things that data, that data management in a big, picture looks like yeah which is uh, in financial institutions has been very popular since 2008 but it didn't have a lot um but one of the things i'm going to say about it is you because you because we've got a compelling event and we've had to look through everything and we've got everything stacked in here the stuff that we haven't done we can hand over to the data management team so we can get we're going to give the data management a really good start better start than the first time in the businesses or the organization's you know life They'll actually know every single data issue they've got. Uh, and it's then a question of whether you do anything about it or not. It's irritating when I go back to companies 10 years later and the DQRs are still rotting away in a cupboard somewhere. But yeah, so that's so yeah, so that's that that's our that's our migration uh, governance 
bits and bobs. Um, the DMZ. Okay, as we all know, DMZ, we all know. Does everybody know what DMZ stands for? Come on, shout it out. Exactly, the demilitarized zone. And it's obviously we're not talking about uh, wars anywhere here. We're talking about like North and South Korea. We're talking about um, it's the old thing from file transfer protocol that you you know if you're going to pass something from one side to the other, one side pushes puts it in the D, the DMZ, and then the other side picks it up out of the DMZ. Um, now, in data my in, in most data migrations you know, of, of any scale, the, the actual delivery of this part, the design and the final mile, the final loading, is usually the responsibility of a third party, either the person who sold you the software or a, a delivery agent on their behalf. So, you, you know, you, <laughs> surely some of these guys in the room now. So, uh, yeah, so they, they're, they're responsible for that, for that part of it. And, and yes, there will generally be exactly like that, you know, that from this side of things and here and all this sort of places there will you know there'll be a, a description of what the data is that's required will come this way and the data will come this way and typically it's stacked in a uh, it's either passed through a csv files or it's stacked in a matching database which is lifted and shifted but however it moves you have exactly that sort of thing there's, there's one side and the other the, one of the key things <clears throat> to protect both sides is to make sure you know what the boundaries of responsibility are. So for instance, you know, we said in here that we're going to do two ETLs. One is going to be into the target, one of is going to be possibly into our archiving solution. So who's responsible for doing that? Who, at what point does that get kicked off? Typically it's not the responsibility of, of your supplier. Typically it's the responsibility, but it's, it's, it's understanding that and making sure both sides are protected in the initial contract so that it's clear who's responsible for doing what. Which doesn't mean to say the good guy, the white hats in, in you know, and I'm sure that's exactly what we've got here, but the white hats in, 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 uh, in a, a thing, which most suppliers are really, uh, will obviously go beyond the boundaries. And so will, so will they, you know, to, to help sort of things out. Oh, we've seen this before, you know, that's the sort of solution that we can put in. And that's why one of the reasons, you know, we need to have them in, the, in taking part in the DQR process. Um, but when push comes to shove and things things aren't going right, then people do tend to stand behind their contracts. So it's useful to know. The one thing about knowing what everybody's doing is you know what each side that you know how much stuff you've got to do, how much stuff they've got to do, and exactly how it's going to work. So the DMZ supports, and, and as you see, it cuts through quite a few processes. It cuts. I can't really draw it on here, but it cuts through virtually all the processes. Um, working out in that particular instance, who is responsible for you know, for doing the the, the uh, profiling, who is responsible for defining what the data quality rule, the, the you know the rules for doing your, your data quality are going to be, and who is responsible for you know cleansing the 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 stuff you're getting out of, out of the source. So it's <coughs> it's important, and if you get that sorted out, you'll, you'll have a <coughs> as the as the poet Robert Frost says, stout uh, stout fences make for good neighbours. So it it just helps everybody really. <coughs> 